Testing, one, two, three, test, test, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three, testing, one, two, three, test, test, one, two, three. Testing, testing, one, two, three, test, test, one, two, three, testing, one, two, three. Okay. That's the one that you said does work or does not work? Does not work. Okay. You want to hear it? Yeah. Testing one two three. Testing one two three. Okay. There is another one. Okay. Did you try that? Yeah. Make make your uh, equipment higher a little bit. The volume a little bit higher. And now let me test it for you. Testing, one, two, three, testing, one, two, three, test, test, one, two, three. Okay. This one does have any kind of settings? It has a non setting and a setting. Okay, this is live. All right, and you still don't have it? Okay. Can you see if I plug into the... To the XLR. Yes. You will get it. Uh-huh. Make it line as well. Make make it line as well. Okay. Testing one two three. Testing one two three. Testing one two. Gotcha. Hold on. right now. Testing, one, two, three. Testing, one, two, three. Works good? Yes. All right. Testing, one, two, three, four, five, six. I spy drive fear films, six, seven, act, not ten. Okay.
Good afternoon, everyone. This subcommittee will come to order. I want to apologize in advance. I'm going to have to step out, and I will return shortly and, and have asked uh, Congressman Bilirakis to uh, preside in my absence, so thank you uh, for that. I want to thank everybody for joining us for today's hearing of the Subcommittee on Economic Opportunity of the House Committee on Veterans Affairs, where we will begin our first oversight hearing on the implementation of H.R. 3218, the Harry W. Colmery Veterans Education Assistant Act of 2017, also known as the Forever GI Bill. This bill was designed, or rather signed, into law by President Trump on August 16, 2017, and is a great example of what Congress can do when we put the American people, and in this case our veterans, first and foremost. In addition to the efforts of Chairman Rowe and other members of this committee, the Forever GI Bill was the result of the good efforts of uh, many of our VSOs, two of whom are joined here with us today on the panel, Student Veterans of America and the Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors. This was the first major improvement to the GI Bill since 2011 and encompassed over 30 provisions brought forth by many members of this House who share all of our commitments to the men and women who serve either in uniform or alongside their active duty spouse or parent. While we can all be proud of this uh, collective achievement to pass the Forever GI Bill, <clears throat> this subcommittee's work has just begun, and it's critical that we work in tandem with the VA, with veterans groups and other stakeholders as the department begins the implementation of this newly expanded and revised bill so that we can ensure that it's rolled out uh, seamlessly. Many of you can uh, remember the significant delays that beneficiaries experienced back in 2009. I actually wasn't here then, but I'm told there were delays in 2009, and they, uh, we don't want that uh, in this round of uh, implementations. Um, and uh, this happened after the passage of the post-9-11 GI Bill, and I'm sure, again, we can all agree that such delays can't happen again, and uh, it's our job to identify any problems and solve them and have a smooth implementation, cost-effective uh, for, for all stakeholders involved. I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the VA's education services efforts to schedule regular calls with the committee staff on both sides of the Hill to update them on the implementation. However, I think it's important that we have these hearings so that um, we can discuss as committee members and we as committee members can lend our support and our help to you, General Worley, and others in the department as you work to implement this uh, reform package. I do have some concerns about the focus this process is getting from the VA senior leadership. This is a theme for me, it seems, as we have found that education programs are often overlooked within the department as a whole. I understand the secretary and his leadership team have many priorities, but I hope they understand that uh, it will be no small feat to execute such a large reform initiative such as this bill, which will result in over $3 billion worth of changes to the GI Bill for generations of veterans and their families to come. Our investments and the taxpayers' investments in veterans' education benefits and the impact that the Forever GI Bill will have on our future success of student veterans is, I'm sure you will agree, an extremely important endeavor, and we've got to get it right. So I urge the Secretary and this administration to do whatever they have to do to give folks the resources, especially the IT resources in this case, uh, that they need to roll this package out effectively without major hiccups, again, like we saw or were experienced in 2009. Before I yield to Ranking Member O'Rourke, I do want to focus in for just a moment on these IT resources uh, I just mentioned. I'm anxious to hear uh, some of the testimony, and I have certainly have some questions about this. Um, since joining this committee, it's always uh, been clear that VA's IT systems and plan upgrades are often so convoluted that when Congress makes changes to the GI Bill or form, uh, or form needs to be updated, the patchwork system of IT programs is not able to keep up, which can cause significant delays for student veterans. I am concerned because the subcommittee has been told during multiple hearings in the past that the plans for these systems would ensure agility so that the VA could quickly address changes that were made in the law. As we have seen, however, that just hasn't been the case. Directing IT resources to education programs is not often a focus of the department. Now, I hope this practice does not continue. 
especially for something as important as the Forever GI Bill. And I look forward to continuing to work with the VA and my fellow members to ensure these resources are provided where and when needed. Now, I want to yield to my friend and ranking member, Mr. O'Rourke, for any opening remarks he might have. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, there's not too much that I can add to uh, your excellent opening comments, but to thank you and the majority staff and the minority staff uh, for ensuring that we have a successful hearing today for uh, those about to testify, for our colleagues and, and their questions. I think all of us want to make sure that the Forever GI Bill is implemented successfully and that we anticipate um, any concerns ahead of time and work constructively together uh, between Congress and the administration to see how we can um, ensure that those are resolved. And like the chairman, uh, I see the biggest challenge being one with IT. And so appreciate the fact that General Worley is here and that he has brought someone who can help to answer those questions and suggest how we work together um, to ensure that this goes smoothly and seamlessly for transitioning service members and for veterans. Also want to thank the veteran service organizations that are here today uh, to testify. Looking forward to hearing what they have to say. I yield back. I want to thank the ranking member and now invite our first and only panel to the table. With us today, we have General Robert Worley, Director of VA's Education Service, who is accompanied by Mrs. Chairman Bogue, Deputy Director of VA's Education Service, and Mr. Lloyd Thrower, Acting Information Technology Account Manager for the Benefits Portfolio within VA's Office of Information and Technology. Mr. William Hubbard, Vice President of Government Affairs for Student Veterans of America, and Mrs. Kathleen Mokler, Director of External Relations and Policy uh, Analyst at uh, Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors. So thank you guys again for being here today. Before we begin with your testimonies, I ask that the witnesses, uh, if you would please stand and raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear under penalty of perjury that the testimony you're about to provide is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you. Please be seated. Let the record reflect that all witnesses answered in the affirmative. Your complete written statements will be made part of the hearing record, and all of you will be recognized for five minutes for your oral statements. Let's begin with you. General Worley, you're now recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Chairman Arrington, Ranking Member O'Rourke, and other members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to be here today to discuss VA's work on implementing the Harry W. Colmary Veterans Educational Assistance Act of 2017, also referred to as the Forever GI Bill. Accompanying me today is Mr. Lloyd Thrower, Office of Information Technology, Account Manager for the Benefits Portfolio, and Ms. Charmaine Bogue, Deputy Director for Operations and Education Service and VA's Project Lead for Colmary Act Implementation. On August 16, 2017, the President signed into law the Colmary Act, which makes sweeping changes, which correct inequities, expands benefits, and truly changes the way we view the GI Bill for the future. It is the most comprehensive set of changes to education benefits since the enactment of the post-9-11 GI Bill in 2009. The Colmary Act has become known as the Forever GI Bill because of its most uh, recognized feature is the removal of the 15-year time limitation for eligible dependents and veterans transitioning out of the military after January 1st of 2013 to use their post-9-11 GI Bill benefits. Other important features of the law are that it restores benefits to veterans who were impacted by school closures since 2015, expands opportunities for STEM and IT training, provides increases in funding for state approving agencies, and enhances benefits for surviving dependents and Purple Heart recipients. The importance and complexity of the Comary Act led VA to establish a cross-functional program executive office within existing resources responsible for leading and coordinating all forever GI Bill implementation activities. Also in record time, VA awarded a 12-month program management contract that provides further support to the PEO through the addition of, of uh, additional expertise in IT, training, and communications. The law requires a significant IT effort with 22 of the 34 provisions requiring IT modifications at an estimate of $70 million. OIT has committed to providing a solution for the most pressing of these provisions, sections 107 and 501, which change the way VA pays uh, monthly housing benefits. VA will assure 
continued timely processing of additional claims related to the Comeria Act and will stand up new initiatives such as the Edith Norse Rogers STEM Scholarship by establishing specialized teams using its more experienced claims processors and by hiring 202 additional temporary employees in the field. VA has taken significant steps since the law's signing, first focusing on the 15 provisions that were effective on date of enactment and executing an expansive and multifaceted communications campaign to highlight and promote the Comeri Act's improvements to affected beneficiaries and other stakeholders. Specifically, VA has promoted the Comeri Act extensively through a new webpage, social media, a variety of outreach activities, traditional media, as well as frequently asked questions. VA has been posting multiple updates on its GI Bill Facebook page, and in November, VA held a forever GI Bill Twitter town hall reaching over 170,000 users and participated in a satellite media tour conducting interviews with 23 radio and television stations reaching 4 million viewers and listeners. We also have sent out three mass emails to 1.2 million stakeholders and have conducted multiple briefings to school certifying officials and veteran service organizations. As you know, many of the Act's provisions target certain categories of beneficiaries. So VA is also conducting more targeted notification where and when needed. For example, we have identified and notified nearly 8,000 education beneficiaries uh, that may be eligible for restoration of entitlement under the school closure provision. In just under one month, VA has already received over 400 applications and has restored 1,800 months of entitlement to over 200 beneficiaries. In just under four months, VA has moved out quickly and is working hard on successfully implementing all of the provisions of the Comeri Act on time. There is a great deal of work remaining with 13 of 34 provisions affected on, effective on August 1st of 2018. VA has already started revising, uh, on re revising regulations, developing policy, designing training, preparing communications, and more as we move forward. We look forward to continuing to work with all of our partners and stakeholders on these efforts. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today, Mr. Chairman, and look forward to responding to any questions the committee may have. Now we'll recognize uh, Mr. Hubbard. You are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member O'Rourke, and members of the committee, thank you for inviting Student Veterans of America to testify on the implementation of the Forever GI Bill. With nearly 1,500 chapters representing over 1.1 million student veterans in schools across the country, we are pleased to share the perspective of those directly impacted by the subjects before this committee. Signed into law this August, H.R. 3218, commonly known as the Forever GI Bill, made history. As one of the most significant pieces of higher, higher education legislation to occur this century, millions of service-affiliated students will have greater access to education and training thanks to the efforts of this committee and the 115th Congress. We would like to share some brief history and intent from our perspective on the legislation, which was a case study in partnership and bipartisan discussion. This past year, we launched a special focus on the importance of sustainability in programs, driven by outcomes, and fueled with data-driven decision-making. The Forever GI Bill includes dozens of solution-oriented provisions, such as the work-study authorization, science, technology, engineer, and math scholarships, removal of the time limit on the GI Bill, and many other provisions which increase access to education. The new law will also address inequities of this earned benefit and looks forward to the future well beyond our own generation. As leading advocates for the bill, we are committed to the complete and timely implementation of this law. With that interest in mind, we thank the committee for this opportunity to highlight several key areas of success as well as some with which have room for improvement. We applaud the Department of Veterans Affairs for their dedicated staff for demonstrating great initiative in implementing the Forever GI Bill, especially their very public communications effort to make those affected aware of upcoming opportunities. Until Forever GI Bill, student veterans attending schools with unexpected closures were the only students in higher education with no reasonable recourse to recoup their benefits. The most prolific examples of these include the closures of Corinthian Colleges and ITT Tech. Unfortunately, Thousands of student veterans were adversely affected 
due to the poor performance of these schools, and we applaud VA for producing an application for these students to apply for restoration of their benefits. We are concerned that so few students have applied for the restoration of benefits under the school closure provision since the notice from VA went out to these students. Like our concerns with reaching eligible Purple Heart recipients, the integrity of individual contact information within the VA system may not be reliable. We encourage VA to partner with external organizations such as Student Veterans of America and others to reach out to the widest audience possible. Turning to the Edith Norse Rogers STEM Scholarship, this provision, orig this provision originated from HR 5784 from the 113th Congress, the GI Bill STEM Extension Act, a bipartisan bill co-sponsored by Congressman David McKinley and Congresswoman Dina Titus. We were a proud partner in the formulation and advocacy of this effort, and we are pleased to see it as a law. Student veterans consistently cite this as a component of the Forever GI Bill with which they have the greatest interest. As the Forever GI Bill was being developed, it became increasingly clear that the implementation costs, particularly IT changes and upgrades, would be a significant driver of cost. We have major concerns on whether or not the offices implementing this law are receiving adequate resources to execute this overhaul. The Forever GI Bill represents a significant shift in education for veterans and in higher education in general. More important than inputs and outputs are outcomes. That is more apparent today than ever. The GI Bill is an American success story because it has demonstrated results. As President Thomas Jefferson said in 1808, the same prudence which in private life would forbid us paying our own money for unexplained projects forbids it in the dispensation of public monies. With the implementation of Forever GI Bill, we raise the question, who should be allowed to play in GI Bill land? Consider the precedent of the VA Home Loan Program. Many banks do not qualify for these loans due to the rigorous and strict standards, leading to outcomes impressive by any standard. And perhaps the same should be thought about for the GI Bill. We thank the chairman and the ranking member for inviting us to testify and look forward to any questions you may have. Thank you so very much. Now I'll recognize Mrs. Uh, Mokler for five minutes. Thank you. Welcome. Mr. Chairman, Ranking Member O'Rourke, and distinguished members of the subcommittee, the Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors thanks you for the opportunity to talk about issues important to the families we serve, the families of the fallen. While the mission of TAPS is to offer comfort and support for surviving families, we are also committed to improving support provided by the federal government for the families of the fallen, those who fall in combat, those who fall from invisible wounds, and those who die from illness or disease. TAPS appreciates the attention the committee has paid to making sure that veterans and surviving family members have benefits that give them access to quality education. TAPS provides specialized support through our web education portal regarding the education benefits available for the children and spouses of America's fallen heroes. TAPS staff members work with each individual to maximize the financial support they can receive to complete their education from both government and private agencies. This also allows us to hear from survivors where they encounter problems and stumbling blocks in the process. We are most grateful for the provisions included in the Harry W. Cole Mary Veterans Educational Assistance Act of 2017 that support survivors and most appreciative of the opportunity to comment on the implementation of this legislation. We have heard from many of TAP's surviving spouses concerning the implementation of the Forever GI Bill. While they are most appreciative of the enhanced benefit, many have concerns. We have worked with the VA to solve many of them. First of these is the delimitating date, the date found on a VA certificate of eligibility that informs the individual of the date they are no longer eligible for education benefits. As of early December, eligible students are still receiving the letters with the 15-year delimitating date. While some students are aware of the delimitation date, they are reluctant to actualize their education plan until they have the correct information on their certificate of eligibility. TAPS did query the VA Office of Economic Opportunity about this discrepancy. The office offered that while IT upgrades are in process, the system does not currently allow the letter to go out without a delimitating date. 
We appreciate the steps that this office has taken to develop a workaround, including enhanced training to call center personnel to assure eligible recipients that indeed there is no delimitating date, sending letters informing spouses that have previously applied that there is no delimitating date, and manually changing new certificates of eligibility until they find a permanent solution. As said before, the success of the implementation is entirely dependent on changes to the IT system. We hope there will be appropriate funding to expedite this process. While mandatory training for school certifying officials is included in the Forever GI Bill, we are concerned about the schools being fully aware of the changes coming in August 2018. Information is being pushed out by the VA. We hope there will be coordination within the schools so that the person actually talking to the student is aware of the changes. TAP's biggest concern with all the changes being implemented in August is that there will be delayed payments for veterans and survivors enrolled in the fall 2018 semester. Even with the, food, the few changes that went into effect this fall, there were issues with schools demanding payment from the student because of delayed VA payments. Students receiving VA payments were not allowed to attend classes, register for spring 2018, or use campus facilities because the VA payment was delayed. In some cases, students were put on payment plans they could not afford or forced to take out student loans with egregious origination fees in order to continue the education program. TAPS would recommend that students receiving VA payments have the same protection as those who receive Title IV funding, such as Pell Grants and federal student loans, who are not penalized for a late payment. TAPS strongly believes that the best way to do this is through a legislative change. We have been in discussion with HVAC majority staff to assist these students. The proposed legislation would give the SEC VA the ability to dis disapprove any course of education unless the educational institution providing the course permits individuals to attend or participate in courses pending payment by the VA and accepts a certificate of eligibility as a promise of payment. Continued cooperation between the VA, the committee, and interested VSOs, MSOs, and survivor advocates is essential to make the implementation of the Forever GI Bill a success. TAPS will continue to pro provide feedback to both the VA and the committee on the experience of survivors. Thank you, and I look forward to your questions. You're welcome, and I, I thank the panel for their testimony today. Now I'll recognize myself for five minutes for uh, questions. Uh, first question will be for General Worley. Uh, General, first of all, thank you for your service to our country. Uh, General, on a conference call last week, subcommittee staffs uh, were informed that due to a problem with the VA's IT system, the department will still have letters and certificates of eligibility that will be sent out to the uh, Chapter 33 beneficiaries that show that their GI benefits expire, despite the change made in Section 112 of the Forever GI Bill. On the call, the proposed work around uh, wasn't to, to fix the system, but to send the beneficiary a separate letter telling them to basically ignore the first letter. What are the department's plans to address the situation, this particular situation, which if not addressed will certainly cause mass confusion for all uh, program participants? And, uh, you know, it's really, I can't believe that, th that this is happening. Uh, and, uh, you know, our, our, our soldiers, our, our veterans deserve better. Uh, they deserve certainty. So uh, if you could please answer that question, I'd appreciate it very much. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Couldn't agree more that we want to put out consistent and accurate information to our beneficiaries. Um, and we appreciate uh, the, the concern that the committee has on this. I'll answer this. Uh, I'll start with part A of the answer and uh, I'll turn it over to Mr. Thrower to talk about Part B of the answer. Part A of the answer has to do with the initial certificate of eligibility uh, that was mentioned uh, uh, 
by uh, our colleague here at the table. So that has to, that's the initial original claim that comes in and we issue a certificate of eligibility after we've uh, uh, done what we need to do to, to uh, check uh, eligibility requirements. Those are manually generated and we can, we can uh, and we'll start this month, uh, manually updating those letters so that it, uh, it's, it's clear because there will be uh, uh, well, not for the certificates of eligibility starting now, but we have to check the eligibility and make sure it's after January of, of uh, uh, 2013. And then those letters will be updated accurately to reflect whether there is or is not a delimiting date. Um, How much the, time will that take uh, to, to manually update the letters? These letters are, uh, are partially, ma they're manually produced anyway, these, the initial certificate of eligibility. So, it's, it's a little bit of added time to the claims examiner's work to, uh, to do that. So it's, it's not a big impact. Uh, the bigger impact that we were concerned about has to do with the enrollment letter, the award letters. So every term someone goes to school, they get an award letter that updates them on the amount of benefit they have left and, and what they're being paid in housing and so forth. Uh, the reason these letters are difficult to change quickly is because they're integrated and tied into the code of the long-term solution, our, our automated solution. Uh, so I'll turn it over to Mr. Thrower to talk about what we're doing with respect to the award letters. Please. Yes. Uh, <coughs> thank you. And, and you know, since our discussions with staffers on Friday, we've actually gone back. I've been working with my engineering team. And we're, we have built a, we're, we will be delivering a workaround where we will be delivering a solution in our March release of LTS. The key thing here is making code changes to the logic that generates the, that generates the letters. Uh, we're doing this at the same time while we're in a massive effort, which I discussed with this committee back in June, of trying to decommission BDN, which is, a, which is another system, part of that patchwork that Chairman Arrington discussed, that we're trying to clear, clear up. And so we're, in, we're sort of in the process of, of eliminating the patchwork underneath the hood at the same time then making changes within LTS while we're doing that is, is a problematic and risky thing that we're trying to manage that risk. That said, there are, quite, there are a few things that we're committed to doing and making happen within LTS system while we're doing that up, while we're doing the decommissioning work on PDN. One of those will be the changes to letters we will have those done within the March release of LTS. Is there a possibility you can contact, uh, you know, obviously, the heroes uh, to ease their mind, maybe verbally, uh, over the telephone, what have you, maybe not an official notice? But have you considered that as well? Or, uh, you know, if you can post it on the website or, or uh, get it to the congressional offices so that we can get the information if they call in? Uh, Absolutely, we, we can do that. We'll, uh, this is uh, relatively late breaking news, so we'll put that on we our definitely media, have to on get Facebook. The word out. Absolutely. On our updates Facebook, to the committee. Facebook, what have you, social yes, media, uh, we can all help. All right, uh, Absolutely. I don't have much time left. Um, why don't I go ahead and yield to the uh, ranking member? Thank you, for, you're recognized for five minutes. Thanks, um, I have a number of questions, but I, I don't know that I, um, understand the answer yet to uh, uh, Mr. Bill Rackus's question on, on this 15-year time limit. Are letters going out today still erroneously saying you, you have to um, use this within 15 years? Yes. And, and not a programmer, um, but, but I, I gotta think that's, and don't go into detail, uh, but, but I gotta think that that's not a three-month fix you said by March this will be fixed. I mean, can, can somebody, as they're printed out, just manually with a, with a, with a Sharpie cross that line out uh, before it goes in, or can we do that in the code? I just, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't sit with, with anyone, Pro probably yourself included, General Worley. Is, is there a way we could do this um, now instead of in three months? I, I don't think so, uh, Congressman O'Rourke. Um, I, I understand the incredulity of uh, you can't change a letter quickly, 
Um, but again, the letters that go out are, are integrated and part of uh, essentially the, the, the automated code. And they need to be that way because we're sending personalized uh, uh, information to each beneficiary related to their benefits and uh, how much they're getting and those kinds of things. Um, to, it's not just going into a Word document and changing a few lines. Uh, it's much, much more uh, complicated than that. Um, so uh, we, we'd love to do it uh, more quickly, um, but I, I, I'm relying on our, our IT uh, colleagues to, to tell us what's within the realm of the possible and how quickly we can do and, it. And maybe there, there's someone out there in the, uh, in, in the private sector or in the volunteer community who would be willing to, to take a look at this code and, and uh, offer their expertise if, if we are so taxed in being able to change this. It just um, not to in any way undermine the success that you've shown in being able to implement this following the, the August signing, but this, this is something that I think sticks out uh, for everyone. Uh, another um, issue that uh, Ms. Mochler uh, brought up is the uh, delayed VA payments, and she uh, suggested using the Pell Grant model. In, any thoughts on that, uh, General Worley? Um, I, I don't have any particular view of that right now, uh, sir. We, we haven't really addressed that issue in my office. Uh, certainly would love to talk more about that. I suspect that, that would clearly take legislative change to do it that way. Yeah, and you- And you we'd be happy to, to work with the committee. Yeah, that, so, so you'll give us your, your, uh, your feedback on that, and I understand the majority staff may already be working on this. We would certainly, from the minority side, um, want to want to be able to work on this as well and make sure that we're we're successful. Um, Mr. Hubbard loved your point about um, the outcomes uh, more important than the inputs, uh, and um, and we've had this conversation about several programs that come through this committee. Uh, want to make sure that we're um, fully measuring outcomes here as well. And you suggested that we should have. Uh, greater scrutiny and higher expectations for the educational institutions that are that are participating. Any specific recommendations uh, as we continue to perfect uh, this law or uh, administratively uh, anything that, that uh, General Worley could run with? Yes, thank you for the, the question, um, Mr. Rourke. I appreciate that and I think it is a relevant and, and really critical point. Um, today, and, and my colleagues from the VA can correct me, but I think it's somewhere in the realm of 14,000 programs are approved for GI Bill dollars. 14,000. Uh, that, that's crazy. Uh, all of those schools, uh, I suspect, are not delivering good outcomes for student veterans. Uh, I know that firsthand. I could probably point out a couple that we all know of. And I think ultimately the focus on outcomes versus just what's going in and what's coming out is absolutely critical. What we know is student veterans are winners. And when given the right tools to succeed, they do every single time. And so that's something that we have a special focus on as it pertains to things that could be changed. Uh, there's some, some inter internal tools that I know of that the VA is taking a look at to increase their, their standards and, and really have some rigorous uh, methodology as applied to who's available to get GI Bill dollars. I think that's something that perhaps uh, the committee would be interested in taking a look at and work with certainly us uh, and many of our, our partners in the nonprofit space to, to implement as well. Yeah, and I'm gonna yield back to the chairman, but as I do, I think if we're able to follow this, this very good recommendation, I think it has to be tied um, to some measure of outcomes so that we, we truly understand performance for these different programs, not just did the student complete the course of study, but then what was their earning potential in the following 10 years, or were they able to uh, find a, a career or a role or function or purpose, and I think all of those are in incredibly important. So thanks for, for raising that. Agreed, I appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Rutherford, the great, uh, from the great state of Florida, uh, my colleague, uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And thank you, panel, for uh, appearing here this, this afternoon. And uh, General, I'd, I'd like to begin with you and, and ask, uh, can you tell me how, uh, how aware have you made the, the senior political leadership uh, at VA aware of the challenges that implementation of this legislation has created for you? 
I've, I've personally briefed the secretary uh, just uh, a matter of uh, a few weeks after the uh, Comeri Act became law um, with those challenges, uh, both the IT uh, assessment of about $70 million and uh, our initial assessment of what would be required in terms of people without uh, IT solutions. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm, I'm very confident that the Secretary is aware of those challenges. Uh, we've come a long way since that particular briefing mm -hmm. in terms of uh, the Office of Information Technology stepping up to addressing mm -hmm. the two most uh, critical in, uh, initial provisions dealing with housing allowance, uh, which had the biggest people impact. And so those are underway along with the, the massive effort on BDN, as Mr. Thor, Thrower rec, uh, mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, and, and some of that has been absorbed in terms of the funding. We need more funding later, but uh, at this point, um, we've come a long way. So I think the senior leadership is aware of these challenges and, and uh, we're getting the support. Okay, and, and, and to drill down on the, the, the IT a little bit, uh, Mr. Thrower, uh, 22 of 34 uh, elements are gonna require IT, as I heard earlier. Um, can, can you talk about, uh, has there been anticipation of what the 2019 budget needs to look like to give you the, the capabilities that you need within IT uh, to fully implement Colmery? Uh, yes, we have had pretty extensive discussions internally about what it would take to do this. And actually at the Secretary's uh, request, we've actually been looking at alternative approaches of managing this endeavor as well. You know, whether potentially uh, a, one of the, for instance, one of the most significant things that we will have accomplished in eliminating, consolidating uh, all education services around the LTS platform, mm -hmm. eliminating BDN and several of the, a lot of the patchwork under the hood is we will be, we will be given the, we will have the opportunity to actually even potentially look at this as a managed service. And so we're gonna be looking, we're gonna have sort of a decision date this spring Mm -hmm. of where we are with the decommissioning effort, what our options are in the external market, what our options are within, if we go the uh, in-house development. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think we're, uh, because of the work that we're doing and the work under the hood with BDN, we're actually gonna have a lot more options from an IT perspective of different ways that we could, we could solve this problem. It's gonna get, very good. And, and I, I want to ask uh, Mr. Hubbard and Mrs. Mokler uh, uh, about, you know, the fact that educational services, uh, the oversight falls w within VA benefits. And there's been some discussion about some unique problems that that creates. And, and Mr. Thrower, but before they, they comment, uh, do, you, do you see that as an issue for IT, that the oversight is under benefits as opposed to education services? I, I mean, you work across uh, different chains of command anyway within VA, I actually I'm sure. think it's a really good fit within, within benefits. Uh, okay. In fact, because of many of the other, cap at least from an IT perspective, mm. I look at many of the capabilities we've delivered over the last few years have, have been able to have created certain services that have been uh, are allowing us to integrate capabilities across the department. The fact that we now, for instance, have an, an electronic e-folder that 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 uh, consolidates and has in one place things like birth certificates, marriage certificates, other critical documents that is now being that can be used by education benefits or Different. comp and pen and yeah. many of the other areas. This has been a great benefit to us and is is creating okay. a lot of flexibility we otherwise didn't have. Okay, I, I'm just about out of time. Mr. Hubbard, Ms. Mokler, if, if, if Mr. Chairman, if they could just yeah. briefly answer, uh, is that a problem for you? And Ms. Mokler, I think you actually mentioned a, a legislative issue that could help with some of this oversight. Was that correct? Um, yes, but that was pertaining to the um, delay of payment of the um, of the VA benefits to the colleges who right. weren't allowing the, uh, the students to uh, take advantage of 
re-registering for the next semester or just with that facilities. certificate. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Mr. Hubbard. I think it's a, an excellent question, uh, Mr. Rutherford, and thank you for addressing it because I'm actually going to disagree a little bit with my colleagues from VA on this one. Um, I've seen long term the, the focus on outcomes is lost when economic opportunity as an office is buried within benefits. I believe there's an opportunity to perhaps elevate that office as an issue area uh, mm -hmm. and provide some potentially preventative medicine. We know that individuals who have a, a, a bachelor's degree or higher oftentimes uh, have great success in life. We'd like to see more of that. And unfortunately, I think the IT debate highlights the fact that there is some uh, perhaps disinterest within the larger organization, not out of any particular um, spite, but more, more by the fact that it's a huge organization right. of more than 360,000 employees. And when you're talking about uh, a small s subset of that, it's difficult to get the right attention. I believe that there's definitely opportunity to elevate that office. Right. And, and, I, and I agree with your focus on outcomes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Problem. Uh, I'll recognize Mr. Correa for five minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I just want to thank the panel for being here. Uh, uh, very difficult issues, but I appreciate your being forthright and honest about the challenges that we have in front of us. Um, I'm not going to get mad, not going to get angry over the fact that we have these letters that are going out with these mistakes, uh, causing confusion out there with the veterans. Um, 14,000 approved um, institutions where veterans can get their education services. And as uh, Mr. Hubbard said, we're not focused on outcomes. Just a couple of days ago, I was talking to a gentleman um, that said, you know, Lou, you've got a lot of these openings in California for this huge construction project that we've got coming online. We don't have the skill to train individuals, building trades, the electricians, the specialists. We've got the president talking about a trillion dollar infrastructure project coming online here early in January, February, at least they initially start to discuss these projects. And again, we've got 14,000 institutions. And I'm wondering how many of those are actually going to prepare our veterans for good education. So um, where do we go from here? Uh, it looks like we have challenges in terms of turning this very complex agency department quickly to address these issues on a timely basis. Uh, question to all of you is, have we thought about possibly employing uh, social media to let veterans know what the real information out there is, what the facts really are? Uh, thank you, Congressman. We, we've uh, leveraged social media in a huge way uh, with respect to getting the word out. We have a we have a website, as I mentioned in my testimony. We, uh, we have web pages dedicated to all the Comerity Act provisions with links, for example, to the application if you're a school closure, uh, uh, impacted by school closure. Um, we put things on Facebook pretty much daily, uh, emphasizing certain aspects, especially the- And what has uh, the outcome been of, you know, I have yeah. a daughter that's 17, I've got kids in their early 20s and Facebook is where they live, not on web pages, but Facebook. Facebook. Have you gotten good response? And I'm thinking to myself, as you're trying to put out the good information on Facebook, accurate information, you're sending out letters that are inaccurate. Creation will be of confusion out there. Somebody sees an official letter from your department versus something on Facebook. Uh, maybe we ought to stop sending out those inaccurate letters and focus on social media, getting out the right information. And that's what that's what we're doing. We the Facebook dialogue is is continuous. Uh, and uh, if you'd like some of the feedback about that, some of it is uh, uh, disgruntlement, quite frankly, with the fact that uh, you know the forever part only starts one January of 2013. People that became eligible prior to that, uh, or were discharged prior to that, in some cases have, have uh, you know, concerns about that. So, so there's there's an ongoing dialogue of various concerns. We're trying to push out the information correctly. Uh, we're fixing the letter problem. The C of E's, uh, the the initial uh, letters will be fixed this month, and at least within a couple of months, we'll have the logic fixed for the uh, award letters. 
Thank you, Mr. Hubbard. I'm running out of time. Mr. Hubbard, just wanted to ask you to, and the rest of the panel to engage with us, with my office, with the others here, and trying to figure out how to focus on outcomes because, you know, this is not a new problem. We've heard this over and over again when I was in the state legislature in California. You're not training our students for the right job openings. And so how can we get to that point where we are training veterans for, you know, 50, 60, 70, 80,000 dollar a year jobs when they come back stateside? It's not rocket science. It's essentially putting one opportunity in front of these veterans and making sure they're ready to seize that opportunity. Whatever suggestions you have, please, we're here to listen. Thank you, sir. Well, and thank you for that, uh, Ms. Gray. I, I think it's a, a great point. We, we find that student veterans are making good de decisions as it pertains to their career paths when they have the right information. If they're informed consumers and they know what they're looking for and they see the long-term solution to it, it's an easy decision. Unfortunately, in a lot of cases, they're not getting the right information. And so that's why we're making such a, a strong push to make sure that I guess they my have question that. is, I got six seconds, is why aren't they getting the right information and how can we get them the right information? A, another very, very good point. And I think it points to the fact that the transition assistance program uh, on the DOD side of the house is perhaps uh, worth taking a look at as well. Mr. Chairman, I yield. I agree with that. Uh, Mr. Banks, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. General, great to have you back to the committee once again. Back in March, I, with the help of this subcommittee, I introduced the Veteran Success on Campus Act of 2017, which would make a pilot program, a permanent program. It was rolled into uh, the Forever GI Bill package, which we were very proud of. And I wonder if you could give us an update today on maybe elaborate on the progress that the VA has made with the program now that it's permanent. Have you seen more veterans using it? I know it's only been a short period of time, but have you started expanding the number of campuses? Can you give us an overall update on how that's going? Thank you. Uh, as you know, uh, Congressman, um, that's, uh, the VRE is a, is a separate office for me, but I, I can tell you that uh, from what I understand now, the, the Comeri Act codifies, uh, as you pointed out, uh, the veteran success on campus is highly successful. Uh, program. I believe it's at uh, uh, serving about 90, some over 90 campuses. Uh, my understanding at this point is we don't have plans for expanding the, the program this year. Uh, beyond that, I'd have to take, take back any further, further status for the can, record. Can you elaborate on the lack of, of planning for expansion, as it was clearly a priority in the, in the bill? Uh, we understand that. Understand that, sir. I, I I would have to take that for the record and and have the VRNE uh, folks respond to that for you. We'd, we'd appreciate some feedback on that in the future. Appreciate that. Could you also give us um, provide us some more information on the performance of the VA Education Call Center in Oklahoma and what type of training they are receiving on um, on the legislative changes that were enacted in the Forever GI Bill? Uh, they have received uh, training on this from, from the beginning, uh, fact sheets and, and so forth, in order to be able to respond appropriately. Uh, as you know, that's a big lift with 31 education provisions as part of it, some of them quite complicated. Um, and so uh, we're uh, not only uh, have rolled out the scripts and those kinds of things for them to use, but then continuing to evaluate and, and improve them as we go along. Okay, that's all I got. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Mrs. Rice, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so if I can just say, and I, it's not the fault of any anyone here on the panel, but this is why people have no faith in government. You, you pass a historic bill like this, and the agency that's charged with implementing it does not have the tools it needs to implement it. And it's just insane. I mean, I, I just don't understand that. You can't change something like taking out a 15-year provision. Um, and I just, it's so disappointing that, and maybe this is something that we have to address with Secretary Shulkin, um, that we have to do more to uh, help him. I mean, can anyone, excuse my ignorance, but how long has, have you been implementing it? Over what period? The, the law was signed on August 16th of 2017, so we're about four months into the effort. Uh, have you seen any increase in people applying, understanding that they're, they actually can apply now, thinking that maybe before they couldn't? 
Um, or is it too early to calculate that? Well, I, I guess it depends on which population you're talking about. Some of it is just information to get out, uh, specifically with respect to the, the uh, no longer having a delimiting date for those that uh, exit service after 1 January 2013. Some of them are very targeted, as I mentioned. Uh, there's two provisions within the school closure uh, piece. One of it is retroactive back to January 2015 so that we can um, try to make whole to some degree those who are affected by school closure, the ITTs and Corinthians, as we mentioned earlier. And uh, we have put out communication to them. We've put out the application, developed and put out the application, and we're receiving those and processing those uh, requests as we speak. And as I mentioned, uh, we've already restored, uh, I think it was 1,800 or so months of entitlement to people. So, so that Several of the provisions, I mean, we're moving out and getting, getting the ones that are near term uh, taken care of. Uh, many of the provisions are not affected until one, effective until 1 August of 2018. So, um, so it, it kind of depends, and there are others that are targeted, such as the Purple Heart recipients and, and those kinds of things, and the Fry Scholarship. So we've, we've pushed out communication, especially on the near term uh, pieces to try to inform people as quickly as possible that they may be uh, impacted by a particular set of uh, provision or set of provisions. And uh, as was mentioned, we've armed up the call center and we're putting it out on all our social media and those types of things. So we're trying to get the word out. Just one, one question. The one, one part of the bill required the VA to provide educational and vocational counseling services for certain individuals at locations on uh, institutions of higher learning campuses as selected by the VA. How, uh, next to this on the sheet that we have, it says no action needed. What, so you find that the counseling is sufficient or maybe I'm not understanding that. Uh, you may be referring to the, the provision Congressman Banks was mentioning about VSOC, codifying the VSOC, the veteran success on campus counselors. Yeah. So those, uh, uh, that again, um, at this point, I, I'm not aware of any uh, plans this fiscal year for expanding the VSOC counselors on campus, but I will take that back and-, but, and but did, is that one of the things that you, you said that you recently spoke to Secretary Shulkin about the things uh, that you would need to implement this bill? Was that one of them? Uh, no, ma'am. The, the, the specific provisions I was uh, briefing Secretary Shulkin on had, were all the education uh, the ones that fall within my office, the education service related ones, just 31 of the 34 provisions in the law are, uh, are being implemented by my office. There are three provisions that have to do with uh, VR&E, and that's one of them. So, so who's responsible for implementing uh, that? There's, there's a counterpart colleague of mine, Mr. Jack Kammerer, is the director of VR&E for the, for the VA. So no one here can answer that? Uh, I'll have to take that back okay. to him. But Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I talked to the ranking member, and, uh, and he agrees we should have a second round. If, if you guys are okay with that, we, we want to proceed. So uh, I want to thank uh, you again for being here and then providing the benefits for our heroes. Uh, what they've earned and deserved has always been my top priority in the United States Congress. With that, I want to ask the general. I think that it's so very important, and I think all of us agree on this, uh, for us and those watching at home to hear how the improvements we made in the Veterans Education Assistance Act of 2017 are being implemented. Again, uh, uh, Ms. Rice alluded to that and the status of these reforms. So uh, my first question is related to my bill, the Veteran Act, which was incorporated into the overall bill that was signed into law in August. My provision would provide the VA necessary funding and resources to update its information technology systems to improve the timeliness and accuracy for pr processing of claims for educational benefits. My provision directed the VA to submit within 180 days after the enactment of this act a plan to implement such improvements. So my question is, can you discuss what efforts, General, thus far has been, have been made in this effort? Are there initial hurdles or barricades to get this section implemented, specifically this section, is the VA on track to submit this plan to Congress within the time frame, the 180-day time frame of enactment? 
If you could answer that, I'd appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, that's, that's one of many of the provisions I mentioned that obviously require uh, IT effort that uh, will happen in the future. And I'll defer to my colleague, Mr. Thrower, from the Office of uh, IT, if that's okay. Uh, we, you know, in terms of how, you know, we're planning all of the, at, or what we're doing to automate systems across the board, we have in analyzing the provisions of this act and looking at the, the uh, status of all systems within the, within the education realm that we manage, we have been building a, a plan to show the transition that we're looking at over the next few years. And we are on track to provide you that report in, I believe it's February. This February? Is that the 180 days? I believe it is. Within the, the 180 days? Uh, it's pretty close. I would say, I, I think it is within the 180 days. So, uh, okay, well, we're gonna hold you to that. Uh, let me go ahead and get on to the next question. Uh, can you explain why the VBA uh, Again, the general VBA education services needed to hire 200 plus additional temporary workers to manually process claims because the IT systems are not able to automatically process the claims. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Um, and there's probably two or three categories. So I mentioned in my oral testimony specialized teams. So there are certain aspects of the Colmary Act that uh, cannot be processed within the current uh, automation without, without huge, huge changes. And uh, I would uh, point out the, uh, the STEM scholarship is, is one of those provisions because it's not just nine additional months of benefit. There are uh, parameters associated with the STEM scholarship uh, with respect to uh, who's eligible, how much uh, of the program you've completed. Uh, it's a program of greater than 128 hours and, and you can only go up to 30,000 per individual. So there are many parameters that are uh, what we would say outside of the system um, for processing those claims. We need probably around 40 to 50 people uh, as a team, as our estimate right now, just to process uh, who we think would be eligible under that STEM scholarship program. Uh, another one has to do with, uh, in the more near term, is the School Closure Act. We're trying to hire 27 people right now, and we've got, we're in the hiring process as we speak, uh, to work the school closure uh, uh, pieces of that. These claims that are coming in are essentially manually processed as we get the applications. They're evaluated by, by people, by our claims examiners, more experienced claims examiners, and processed and put into the system uh, through those, those means. So there are uh, two or three specialized teams we have to put together uh, that consist of, or makes up a, a fairly significant part of that 200. And then the rest of the 200 will be put at our regional processing offices as uh, augmentation to the claims examiners that are there today uh, in order to provide the manual workarounds that we have to do until the IT comes on board. So it's just additional people power, if you will, so that we can try to maintain the timeliness uh, that we have today and not, uh, not get into delay situations that you may have heard about. So you th when we implement the, 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 the IT pro portion, which is the Veterans Act, my bill, uh, you think we'll see improvements? Absolutely. Okay. Because that's, you're talking about automating uh, original claims yeah. process. Absolutely. All right, very good. Okay, uh, I'll yield to the ranking member, Mr. O'Rourke, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, I have a few questions for General Worley. Before I do, this will be my last opportunity uh, to, to do this uh, because he's moving on to the next stage in his career. But uh, as with many of the members of Congress, I, I have the uh, benefit of being able to work with a military fellow um, who comes to our office for a year and helps us to 
better understand the issues on this committee, on the other committee on which I serve, House Armed Services. Uh, Captain Mark Walden has just been a pleasure to work with and uh, gives me a lot of faith and confidence in the quality of Americans that we are recruiting and who uh, enlist. And uh, we just wish you uh, much luck in these uh, next steps in your career. And, uh, and it adds a little bit to the urgency that we have in this job and our responsibility to make sure um, that we're following through on our commitments and our obligations here. So just wanted to publicly acknowledge your service and thank you for, for working with us this year. Um, General Worley, on, on, um, when, when you were asked by Mr. Correa about uh, outreach on social media, uh, you'd earlier given us the, 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 the stat about 8,000 beneficiaries um, that you're trying to reach out to uh, who have um, been subject to these school closures. And we want to make sure that we're connecting them with um, the resources they need to finish their, their uh, academic studies. You said 200 or so have been helped so far. What, what does that tell you? And on this issue and on the issue about having to wait another three months to correct the 15-year the um, delimiting statement. Um, help me understand your urgency around these issues and, and whether you see this as a problem, if this is what you expected. Um, and that might go some, some ways towards uh, setting our expectations on the committee. It seems like a low number to me if, if there are 8,000 and only 200 have been helped. Uh, I would just respond to that by uh, saying the initial notice went out on November 9th. So we're, what, five weeks into the process um, in terms of, and, and again, that doesn't mean that's the first communication. We've been trying to flood the pipes with communications across the board on, on all of these uh, provisions, especially the near-term ones. But um, I think it's, quite frankly, I think it's too early to tell whether that's a low number or a high number. We will. Uh, we will continue to, of course, um, you know, take these in, process them as quickly as we can, and uh, if we need more communication or need to reach out to the seventh, whoever hasn't responded yet, uh, we will do that. Um, I don't know that it's realistic to expect that we would get 8,000 applications because, uh, quite frankly, the hope is that the information that's out there would be sufficient for people to look at it and, and make their own choice whether they think they're eligible or not. Now, we always encourage people to submit a claim if there's any question as to their eligibility, but uh, with, especially with respect to this school closure, if you, if you have transferred credits to a comparable program, then you're not eligible for restoral of your benefit uh, between January 15th and uh, the implementation of the Comary Act. So, uh, so we're happy to make that decision once you've given us the, the information on the application and inform you of that, but there may be people that understand that and just don't apply. Um, we're, God willing, all going to be here uh, a year from, from today, still in these same positions. Um, what, what will we be likely talking about at that point if the, if the chairman um, uh, decides to, to hold a hearing on this uh, forever GI Bill um, one year after the last hearing? Um, are, are we resolved on, on all of these uh, open issues? Do you have confidence that the uh, 22 of 34 uh, IT modifications will uh, have been completed, the, the $70 million that, that you need to do this um, effectively spent, at least for, for that part that's been budgeted. Um, what, what do you think we can anticipate uh, a year from now? I would love in a year from now to, to certainly have all the letter issues squared away. Um, <laughs> I don't think, what I hope to say in a year, and Mr. Thrower can back me up on this, is that uh, we've done the work to get off of the benefits delivery, the 50-year-old benefits delivery network as a platform for paying and, and doing a number of other things with respect to education benefits, that sections 107 and 501 are fully and purely and perfectly uh, implemented. Uh, we won't in a year be able to say that the, uh, all the rest of those IT uh, requirements are met. Um, so I, I hope to be saying in a year that we have those funded and in a timeline that OIT is working through um, over the following year, but um, I'll, I'll let Mr. Thrower comment on that. I, I think that's a pretty accurate statement. I think, you know, as I say, we're looking, we have been balancing priorities here. 
We started an effort before this act was, was enacted to eliminate a major legacy problem within our environment. And so when this act was in, uh, and, and in fact, education services is the number one priority within OINT as relates to the Veterans Benefits Administration in uplifting services. Dealing with that legacy issue will provide us a great deal of agility to be able to make the kind of quick changes you're talking about long term. We're trying to fix that. That will largely be done at the end of this fiscal year. In the meantime, you know, what we will have accomplished is we, you know, in working together with General Worley and the education team, you know, we identified those critical things that we absolutely had to do within an IT solution now yeah. in order to make this work. And so we have integrated that within the same program that is doing the decommissioning work, which is a balance that we have to make to be able to do that. We are looking very, very hard at managed services solutions versus in-house development solutions. I will say that, you know, we're hoping that, say, October 1 of next year, we will have, well, next spring, we'll make a decision of which direction we wish to go. We will be in the, in the throes of implementation of all of the other provisions a year from now down the path that we will have determined in the spring and probably execute at the beginning of October. I appreciate that, and, and thanks in advance for all the work that you're gonna do on that. And, you know, I, I for one, don't have the subject matter expertise on, on all this, including the, the IT fix and, and other parts of the IT problems. And, and I just know from past experience that GAO has been so helpful to me in, in understanding and kind of providing a check and a third party uh, scrutiny on, on the commitments and the performance. And I hope that we can get some help from GAO, not in any way to, say that I have a lack of confidence because I don't. You all have been uh, very helpful and very professional in, in implementing this. I just think given the, the group of veterans that we're talking about and the necessity of implementing this successfully, I just want to make sure that we have um, you know, the, the greatest oversight possible uh, that will help us to, to do our job. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, for letting sure, me go over. Absolutely. Uh, I understand the doctor doesn't have any questions. Is that right? Okay. Then we'll move to Mr. Correa. You're recognized for five minutes. Sir. No questions? Okay, I have one question and then I'm gonna ask the ranking member if he wanted to make any more comments. Uh, the question is for, uh, for Ms. Mochler. Uh, in your testimony, you described a situation where some students are demanding payment, uh, the schools are demanding payment of tuition and fees uh, and then the VA has delayed in, in the payments, what have you. Uh, what can be done to address this issue so the students are not negatively impacted by school and VA delays? Well, what we're asking for are the uh, protections for those receiving VA benefits that are already out there for those who are receiving Title IV benefits. So if, the, if a Pell Grant uh, payment is late, um, the student is not penalized. They can still go on, they can register for uh, another uh, uh, semester of classes or what have you because whatever certificate of eligibility they get for their Pell Grant is held as a uh, uh, receipt of payment, as it were. But with the VA, um, many schools do not look at that certificate of eligibility as a uh, payment. They want the payment in hand and so that causes a hardship for many Yes, yeah, so give me uh, an example of the hardship uh because this is unbelievable. It's unacceptable that uh, uh, because tell me we, tell me where, what's the penalty in a lot of cases. Uh, uh, and the uh, student the uh, uni the institution of higher learning will start dunning the student for payment, and ask them to take out a loan to cover that period uh, between when the um, university required the payment and when the VA makes the payment. Yeah. And so then the student is stuck with um, uh, those, um, uh, that, that yeah, bill. They have, and they have that added stress. They do. They should not have. They do. Uh, so that's the real life uh, scenario and we've got to do something about that. Uh, so I appreciate uh, you answering the question. All right, uh, well, I want to ask the ranking member if he had any comments. Otherwise, uh, Mr. Chairman, I don't. Thank you for, uh, for helping to hold the hearing today. And thank you all for, for testifying and for your answers to our questions. 
Okay. All right. Uh, Sorry, sir. That's okay. There you go. No problem. Okay, if there are no other questions, anyone have any other questions? If there are no other questions, uh, I want to thank the witnesses for their testimony and for answering all the questions. We all understand the importance that the passage of this forever GI Bill will have for future generations of veterans to come. We really did great work in this committee, and I thank the chairman, uh, the full committee chairman as well, which is why it is so vital, again, it is so vital that we get implementation right the first time, as Ms. Rice said. We will continue to work with the VA and receive regular updates on how the process is moving along. I ask you, uh, you General Worley, and your staff to not hesitate to let us know if you're lacking the resources you need to get this right. And we will also continue to work with the veterans, the groups like SVA and TAPS, and rely on you. Please, we're relying on you to keep your ears on the ground and keep us abreast with any concerns you are hearing from the membership and as you work with VA in the coming months and years. I now ask unanimous consent that all members have five legislative days to revise and extend their remarks and include extraneous material. Without objection, so ordered. Finally, I'd like to take a moment to publicly congratulate Mr. Hubbard uh, on his promotion to the rank of Staff Sergeant in the United States Marine Corps Reserves. Congratulations, sir. Thank you, for, uh, Mr. Hubbard, for your continued service to our country and Semper Fi. This hearing is now adjourned. Thank you. I need the gavel. Oh, here it is. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thanks, Gus. My pleasure.